All right, here's the maiden flight of the box wing. I've got a 2200 three cell in there. Super simple aircraft. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to put a CC3D in it. Uh, checking the center of gravity, which is 23 centimeters down uh, each of the wings. And you put your fingers under there, and it balances nicely. Check my control surfaces. And the launching procedure is kind of weird. You want to throw it over your head. Grab it by the nose, full throttle, and then up and back at about a 45 degree angle. And I know it's awkward to throw with your left hand, uh, but it helps keep your right hand on roll and pitch. So full throttle. It's a great airplane because it's capable of slow flight and fast flight, even though it has a power to weight ratio of less than one, which is really impressive. It's the advantage of having a high KV motor with, uh, with a prop with a lot of pitch. And it flies pretty much like a wing. I mean, good roll rate, loops, he can do an outside look too. Yep. Flies just like any other wing. But again, a power weight ratio of less than one. If I pull full up, it stops and the nose drops. So even though it has a power to weight ratio of less than one, it still has great speed. Now I'm gonna bring it in for a landing and try not to land it in a puddle. And you can see how slowly it comes down. almost got it. Uh, but again, with these uh, these parts back here that don't move, that are fixed, they just protected it when I dropped it on its, bat, on its butt. Uh, the yellow ones are still fine. So here's the very first box wing. This is how it all started. I had some scrap Elmer's foam board and uh, I built this thing. I call it a box wing because it's basically a box on top of a wing, even though this is actually what a box wing is, uh, where it goes all the way around. Uh, the idea of this is that uh, by connecting it all the way around, uh, you can build it lighter and use the actual structure of it to help support it instead of just using stronger materials or such. So here's the first one. Uh, they're all really similar. The things that I've changed are the length of the nose, the size of the winglets, and uh, a little bit of the area back here near the elevon. So this is version one, top view of it. Uh, here's the inside. Originally, I put a CC3D in it because I thought it would be too difficult to fly. Uh, I was mistaken. The plane flies just like any other wing, being that it has great roll, great pitch control, except the CG has to be in just the right point. There's very little room for error when it comes to CG placement, but everything else about the airplane is fantastic, and the flight controller is optional. Here's version 2. Uh, this one I was flying FPV with it. Good airplane. Here's the inside. Again, another CC3D. This one's a micro. Uh, oh, here's a note. Uh, with the 2200, you get about 10 minutes of flight time. That's getting it. With the 5200, uh, I got 20 minute, minutes of flight time. I was milking it, being super easy on it. I uh, still had 11.4 left in it, so I could have probably gotten a good 25 minutes out of it, at least. Pretty impressive. Even though it doesn't have an airfoil, uh, it is still surprisingly efficient, I guess because of the low wing loading. Version 3, uh, I was flying this one FPV also. Uh, flew it into a tree and covered this section back with some uh, packing tape, and it flew just fine. A uh, couple clicks of trim to adjust for it, 
and it flew fine. Uh, TX02 for the video transmit here. Love these things. Less than 20 bucks. Uh, I'll include this part in the files. Uh, this is pretty neat because in the bottom of it, there's a hole that fits over top of the gear of a servo. So you can connect this to the yaw channel of your airplane, which is free, of course. And then you can look left and right as you fly. Uh, here's the inside of that aircraft, uh, the yellow one. Here is version number four. This one I built just for line of sight. Uh, tapered the nose back a little bit more, uh, which makes it more aerodynamic. Not a significant difference in speed, uh, but it makes the nose a little bit weaker because this sidewall portion right here actually adds a lot of strength, especially when it only comes down at a 45 degree angle. But this was when I learned, no, in version three is when I learned that you want some dead space back here. The elevons don't go all the way to the edge because this area right here uh, is strong. So if it lands on its butt or if it cartwheels or something like that, it won't tear up your elevons and damage them. Here's the inside of version four. Super simple. Uh, version five. Here it is. Uh, a smaller box. Uh, the downside of this being that your push rods have to be longer but it does move the center of gravity farther forward. So if you're trying to build one that flies on a super small battery, like a 1,000 mAh, uh, doing this will get it done. It definitely will get it done because it moves the servos forward uh, and it moves the receiver forward, it moves all the wires forward. Uh, you might have to add a little hot glue on the inside of the nose, but you can definitely fly this on just a 1,000 mAh battery. Oh, here's a toe in. So, uh, I think this is the first one that I started to introduce toe in. Uh, the front of the the winglet is scooted in just a little bit, and that creates some extra drag back there on the winglets. And drag in the back is actually a good thing. It's a stabilizing force. Here's the inside of it. Uh, this one I I used a receiver that has a three-axis stabilizer in it, just gyros, no accelerometer, so it's only rate stabilization. Uh, but this is really nice because it's sort of in between a plane receiver and a flight controller. Super easy to set up, uh, and basically what it lets you do is you, you can fly when it's really windy. Uh, and I did. It, it worked, you know, really well. Yaw, of course, the, the pots turned to zero, and roll and pitch worked out really nicely at uh, 50%. Really nice. So, Elmer's foam board. This stuff is fantastic, and I think more people should uh, should build with it. Check it out. I know Dollar Tree foam board has a huge following, and it is great. It's very cheap, uh, but it's also cheap in the sense that it's really it's really weak. Um, there's no water resistance to it or anything like that. I get mine at AC Moore, and if you go to their website, click on the weekly ad, then you click on uh, coupons. There we go. So this week they have a 55% off one item and a 50% off one item. Uh, this is fantastic. Obviously, you would pick the 55% off. Last week, I think it was only 40% off. Uh, but anyway, you go to this on your cell phone, take a screenshot of this, and then uh, show it to the person at the register. They scan it. Bam. You get uh, the whole piece of foam board for less than $5. And this is enough foam board to actually make two of these airplanes, which is really neat. So there's the foam board. It is 32 inches by 40 inches. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to measure 20 inches over, make a line, and chop it in half. And we're going to set one piece to the side. So uh, in a video, not a video, but in a part that's coming up after this, I'll show you exactly what all these lines need to be and how to draw them for everything to make sense. But there it is. So we're going to cut off this part, and then we're going to cut off this and this which makes our sidewalls. We're going to cut a 45 degree there. Uh, this is about a 45. I'm not sure if it actually is, but it's really, really close to a 45, which is the, uh, the sweep angle of the wings. So on each of these, our servos poke through. So we need to put a servo down and trace it and cut it out, and then put it on top of the other one, trace there, cut it out. They're going to go there. Now, with this other piece of scrap, we're going to make our two elevons. And the elevons, excuse me, uh, winglets. The winglets have been getting smaller and smaller because at first they were too large and it was, this sounds weird, over stabilizing in the yaw. Uh, it would create kind of like a tail wag 
because I think the two the two winglets were fighting each other. So uh, five by four seems to work great. It's fantastic. So you draw a rectangle that's five inches by four inches, cut that out, then cut corner to corner, and then cut an inch off each of the corners. And what you're left with is something that is four inches by three inches. And it works beautifully. An advantage of it being smaller is that uh, if the plane does end upside down, or if it falls on its butt like you saw, uh, they're less likely to break off because they're shorter, and whatever force is being applied to it has less leverage against your glue seam and so forth. So anyway, uh, back to this airplane. Uh, we need to make the elevons. So this section right here where the two X's are, that's going to be removed, and we're going to cut through the top piece of paper along this line and along this line, being sure to stop before we reach this area. This area is what helps protect the elevons back there. Now, in order to get it to actually move, I have to cut this, you have to cut this line, and then again, you have to cut down right beside it. And you can see that it's kind of jagged because I was doing it by hand, but you have to cut twice in two different places to create enough gap for this thing to move past it. After you cut that top layer of tape, uh, top layer of paper and break it, then you can cut your 45 degree bevel. And the cool thing about this foam board is that you don't need to put any tape there. You don't need to, you know, put down a bead of hot glue and then wipe it off. That's it. You just cut it, bevel it, you're set. This material is fantastic, and it has that water-resistant property like the brown foam board that Flight Test sells. And this is kind of what it's going to look like. So the first step you should have done is print your parts. Here's my printer, uh, Monoprice Maker Select V2. I love this thing. I've done a couple mods to it. Uh, fantastic printer. Fantastic for the money. I mean, six bolts and the thing goes together. Basically, you have to put this top piece to the bottom piece, uh, and that's it. This other stuff that I've done to it is just extra. But moving on, uh, you need to put your motor onto the motor mount, and when you do that, uh, make sure that your screws do not go too far and hit the windings. If you hit the windings, you'll kill the motor, and that is sad. This is just a, uh, a mini quad motor. Anything that'll spin a five or a six inch prop, super common for like the 250 size quadcopters. Make sure, especially if your motor has one of these clips back here, that the clip can spin around freely. Uh, I know there's some filament hairs in there, but they weren't in the way, and the clip spun around freely when I turned the motor by hand. Here's the ESC using. Uh, any ESC that's uh, more than 12 amps will work. I've used a 12 amp one before. Of course, it depends on your motor, but 12 to 20 amp ESC is all it takes. Uh, these are really nice uh, because they're thin, of course. They'll take anything from a 2S to a 6S LiPo. That's crazy. I'm just going to run it off 3S. Uh, and it has a 3 amp switching BEC built in, which is nice because I like to take a uh, TX02 uh, camera and solder on a servo lead and then plug that servo lead into the receiver so I can get that 5 volts out of the receiver. Really nice little trick. Uh, here's the prop I'm spinning. Of course it depends on your motor but for a 2150 kV motor like I have uh, a 5 or 6 inch prop is good. I went with a 5 inch because I want to take advantage of the fact that a 5 inch can't and won't hit the ground no matter what even if you set it down on gravel or pavement and spin the prop up, it's not going to hit the ground, so you never mess up the prop on a landing. Um, good props. I like them. You can spin a six, and if you land on grass, you'll be perfectly fine. Uh, everything I use when it comes to glue is hot glue, except when I put this down, I like to use Gorilla Glue. So I Gorilla Glued it down and soldered my ESC directly to the motor, just because I want my ESC to be on the outside. I mean, this thing only pulls about 10 amps usually, uh, but it's just, you know, a design consideration. I don't know. I think it's good practice. Anyway, I added a longer servo lead to it. Uh, if you're going to go ultralight and try to run it off a 1000 milliamp hour, you really want all this to be as far forward as you can. So I wouldn't put the ESC back here. Uh, I'd put a longer wire on it, and uh, I'd shorten the box and move the servos up. Speaking of servos, I'm a big fan of these Metal Gear servos that come from Banggood. You can get six of them for about twelve dollars maybe thirteen maybe fourteen but for about two dollars each you get metal gear servos and they're fantastic because even in a catastrophic crash 
uh, it's not going to mess up the gears inside and you'll be able to reincarnate these and put them into a new airplane especially considering that if you're building this airplane you automatically have enough materials to build a second one which is really nice by the way when it comes to servo testers this says it runs off five volts but you can hook it up to a one cell lipo battery and uh... and it works just fine really nice and i just leave that uh... double-sided tape to the bottom and plug it in when i need it here's the receiver i hate this one but i'm using it because i have it they take forever to connect they bind up like normal everything's good range is good uh, but sometimes it takes up to 30 seconds for it to connect. You know, you turn your transmitter on, and then you plug in your battery, and sometimes it takes 30 seconds to connect. Finicky things. Uh, push rods. I use uh, marking flags from the hardware store, and uh, love my pair of Z-Bend pliers. I bought those about a year ago. I think they're, they're less than 20 bucks, I know that, and they make this really easy. So, uh, I glued on one sidewall, and then I glued on the other sidewall, and then we put the servos in, just a drop of hot glue behind each of the tabs, and push the servo in, like that. Same thing on the other side, and then we add a back panel. I like to make this out of Elmer's board uh, for strength. If you're going ultralight, uh, this should of course be Dollar Tree foam board, but because it's in the back and, you know, there's already enough weight back there. Uh, definitely use a piece of Elmer's foam board uh, for the front. This will add significant strength to the nose. I've, you know, had fail launches before I developed the overhead method uh, where this thing slams right into the ground on its nose. And you pick it up, you know, flick the dirt off of it, and it's good to go. A couple clicks of trim adjustment, but it still flies fun. Definitely use Elmer's foam board up here. Any weight this far forward is actually a good thing, and the extra strength of the foam board. Uh, helps reinforce it. So now we need to put in the control horns. Uh, I just use the, the the right angle from a piece of foam board to mark uh, where it lines up with this. Uh, this is a neat little piece. Uh, if you line up the long edge with the hinge, it'll make sure that the hole or the pivot point for your control horn is exactly lined up uh, at the hinge line, which is nice. So you, you lay this down and then you you know rub over it with a pencil and you know exactly where to cut. Uh, cut down the top cut down the bottom, little cut there, little cut here, and then dig it out with a small flathead screwdriver. And your control horn fits in there really nicely. And the, the bottom paper is still there. Really strong. So control horn in. Uh, I just marked it with a pencil. I usually use a Sharpie. Sharpie's better, but I can still see it. Uh, using the fourth hole from the outside. Most of the time when I build a plane, I use one of these two, just because I love to have lots of throw. But with this plane, you don't actually need it. Uh, if you want it to be really crazy, uh, do the third hole from the outside. But if you want a lot of resolution and normal, reasonable rates, uh, use the fourth hole from the outside. So that goes in there. Uh, got it all lined up. Bead of hot glue. Push that down in. And voila. Looks nice. Oh, worth mentioning with these, uh, these Elevons. This Elmer's foam board is so freaking awesome that even though this control horn is on the outside, on the end of this control surface, the whole thing still stays rigid. It doesn't flex or warp, no need for a carbon strip down or anything like that. This is a fantastic material that more people should use. Now, uh, when you connect these things, you really want to have a neutral position of 5 millimeters of reflex. This foam board's 5 millimeters thick, so it's set up so that the top of this lines up with the bottom of this. This is about right. Uh, there's two ways to do this. Either you can go ahead and make the push rods a little bit shorter, so it goes ahead and pulls them up, or you can make them flat and then adjust this with sub trim. Either way, it's up to you. This time I used sub trim. In the past, I just made them shorter. Uh, if you don't have enough sub trim range or if push comes to shove, you can always add a little bend to your push rod, just a slight U-bend, assuming that it's strong enough and it's not flimsy. A slight U-bend, this will shorten this up and it'll give you that five millimeters of reflex. If you print the 20 degree throw gauge, you can figure out exactly how much up elevator you get. Now more than likely when you put this on the plane and, and pull all the way back on the stick for full up elevator, it's probably not gonna touch. That's because most radios don't give you full throws 
right away. So you want to go into like servo setup and adjust the endpoints. Sometimes what that's called on Turnigy and Flyscribe radios, uh, or the travel uh, on on Spectrum radios. So pull all the way back, and while you're holding back, increase that travel until it comes up and touches like it's supposed to, like this. And that, that's what you want for full up elevator. And for full down elevator, you only want uh, 5 millimeters of down, so kind of the opposite of what your uh, neutral trim setting was. And that's definitely enough. That's plenty. You can do a really nice outside loop like you saw earlier with just this much. I just flew this plane with this setup, which is what you saw. Here's the inside. Everything's nice and neat. Uh, let's see here. Some double-sided tape holding this on. When it comes to receivers, please, I used to make this mistake so often, please be careful of how you position your antennas. I used to just throw them in the airplane and they were like bent and pointing in the same direction and just all kinds of terrible things. The, the radiation pattern and of course the reception pattern for a, a dipole or a simple linear antenna like this is a shape called a toroid or basically a donut, where it's really strong out here on the sides of the antennas. I'm talking about this one right here. Really strong on the sides, and it's really weak right at the tip of the antenna, like where the antenna is pointing, and of course below the antenna, as if like where the bottom of it's pointing. When you have an antenna, when you have a receiver with two antennas, you want to separate them by 90 degrees so that they cover each other's dead zones. That's exactly what you want. And always have one of them pointing straight up because as you know most of the time an airplane is relatively level I mean it's usually banked only a little bit to the left a little bit to the right a little bit nose up or a little bit down in general uh, so your best value so to speak is when your antenna is pointing up if for some reason you have a uh, turnigy antenna that a turnigy receiver that might only have one antenna definitely put it in the up position moving on uh, the only thing that we have left to do is we need to make a, uh, a board that goes over the top. Uh, Got to use Dollar Tree foam board for this uh, for two reasons. One is that we're out of material. <laughs> we don't want to touch that other piece because we can make a whole other airplane about it. And two, uh, this is a, a piece that's not going to add strength. So we really want it to be lightweight. And Dollar Tree foam board fits the bill there. So lay it on top. Uh, piece of tape here, flip it open. Piece of tape there to make a hinge. Uh, piece of orange tape down the back and it goes all the way to the back where it is folded on itself to make a little tab so you can pull it up. Now, Normally, I know some of you are used to working with Dollar Tree foam board, if you peel tape off Dollar Tree foam board it'll delaminate it, it'll peel that paper off, but we used Elmer's board back here so we don't have to put down a base layer of packing tape or anything. Uh, I just eyeballed the toe in just a little bit, about the same on each side. The center of gravity, like I mentioned earlier, is 23 centimeters along the edge. I know most of the time they say, you know, from the root back. That's how they usually say it. But I'm saying 23 centimeters back. And there it is. If you go a centimeter further than this, you're going to seriously lose elevator authority. The plane's going to feel really heavy. Uh, it's going to want to lawn dart. And in turns, it's not going to want to turn. You're going to be, you know, rolled over 35 degrees, 45 degrees, pulling back, and it's going to be turning really slowly. That's how you know your nose heavy. On the other hand, if you move it back a centimeter, uh, it's going to be really sensitive to pitch. In other words, you're going to have too much uh, elevator authority. You're going to give it you know, a little bit of up, and the nose is going to you know, fly up. It's going to be like up and down, up and down, really difficult to control. Now, if you put a flight controller in it, then you can scoot, scoot the center of dra gravity further back uh, and it'll be okay with it because the flight controller will make up for that. Uh, flight controller is optional. The plane flies really well like you saw even with just a normal receiver. Uh, the reason I started out with the flight controller was because it was just such a new airplane. I had way too much throw on it. Really hard to fly. Didn't know where the center of gravity was supposed to be and so that's why I relied on the on the flight controller to, to pick up that slack, but once I figured out you know what the throw should be, the plane flies great with the normal receiver. And here's the inside of the plane that you just saw fly. Um, really simple, really clean, plenty of room to add a FPV camera, a video transmitter, on-screen display, uh, a flight controller, you can go crazy put an APM in it or a Pickhawks or something like that tons of room inside. Uh, it can handle big batteries. It'll handle a big 5200 uh, 3-cell uh, 
Um, super great airplane. Really love it. Looks clean too. So before you put your Velcro strip down, go ahead and hook your battery up and uh, slide it around and figure out where it's supposed to balance. Put your fingertips under these edges and, and see where it's supposed to balance. Then you know exactly where to put your, your Velcro, which is nice. Obviously a bigger battery is going to scoot back and a smaller battery needs to go forward. There it is. All right, here's your sheet of Elmer's foam board, which is 32 inches wide and 40 inches long. Now we're going to cut this thing in half, and that's going to give us enough material to make two airplanes. So I'm going to measure up 20 inches. Now, by the mouse, you'll see a number, and that's where the cursor is right there. But I usually type in exact numbers. So when I type in 20, you're going to see that appear in the bottom right. And of course, the line moves. So I'm going to chop that in half. and going to set that side or that half of it to the side and that could be another airplane. So here's the half of the foam board. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line right down the middle. So here is the center line of the airplane which is 16 inches from that side because this is 32 inches wide. Now the fuselage is 6 inches wide so we're going to measure 3 inches to the left and three inches to the right. Our elevons are two inches. We're going to measure up two inches. And we're going to measure up four inches. And then we're going to measure down four inches because the nose is four inches long. And we're going to draw some lines. So from the front down the side of the nose to the edge four inches above the corner. Same thing on the other side. Now this middle section is going to be gone. We're going to get rid of it. Now when it comes to making the elevons, you're going to cut through the top layer of paper only all the way over. If you go all the way over like that, uh, this whole thing is hinged and this corner here is vulnerable to damage. If it hits cartwheels or if it falls on its butt like you saw earlier. Instead of doing that, we're going to stop two inches short. So we're going to measure in two inches and we're going to measure in two inches. And now when we draw a line over, our elevon is just this portion here and it's protected, which is nice. So you cut through the top layer of paper, uh, you cut here down twice, break it, and then cut your 45 degree bevel. That's it. Now uh, we're going to cut these large sections off the plane. So that one is gone. And this one, I'm going to select it so that we can kind of work with it. So there it is. I pasted it. So imagine that this now goes over here. I'll erase this so it looks nicer. There we go. So from this, we're going to make our sidewall and we're going to make our winglets. So from this long edge, we're going to measure up two inches. This is the height of the fuselage. Uh, it could be a little bit lower because you know your battery's not very tall, your receiver's not very tall, but it looks nice when it's two inches tall. So we're going to measure up two inches and we're going to cut this off just like that. And the only thing that we need to do is we need to make a 45 degree angle here. So this is two inches tall, so we're going to measure two inches down. And we're going to cut from there down to there. And I'll erase all that. So there is our sidewall. And the only thing left to do is we need to make room for the servo. You're going to lay the servo down, of course, and trace over top of it. And it's going to make a pattern, something like this. And you can lay this one on the other one draw your pencil on the inside, cut it out, you're done. The only other thing that we need are the winglets. So that was taken to make the sidewall. And from this piece, we're going to make both winglets. So we want this to be 5 inches by 4 inches. So 5 inches by 4 inches. Going to make these official lines get rid of the rest of it. Now this is five inches by four inches. We're going to cut corner to corner. I'm going to erase one of these. 
but of course you're going to still have it. And then you're going to get rid of one inch off each of these corners. So I'm going to measure one inch this way. There we go, one inch that way, and one inch this way. You can see it makes a little tick mark. Might be hard for you to see, but it's there. And we're gonna make that a right angle, and then we're gonna cut this off, and we're gonna cut this off, and bam! There is our winglet. It is four inches long, and this is gonna be the bottom, and it is three inches tall. Now after you make one of these, after you cut the corners off, uh, it helps a lot to lay this on top of the other triangular piece and trace it and then cut it that way.